The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm hosting today Al Warren, and of course, from the uh, great UK, <laughs> Julie Sav. I love it when you call it the great UK, it certainly is. Hi Al, yeah. how are you? I'm just wonderful. It is the great UK. Come on, you've already had your vaccine. I have. Yeah, yeah. I have. Frontline worker. I've had my vaccine and all good. Jeez. You know, because um, nobody's getting it in the US. <laughs> I can't comment, can I really? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you know, they're actually, they're, the, the anti-vaxxers are out there protesting at Dodger Stadium. You know, it's just crazy. They have to shut down the vaccinations there. Just uh, oh, wow. a lot of new cuckoos out there nowadays. Anyway, um, well, we've got a great show, so we'll just jump right into it because um, this man's got a lot of history. And um, it's a real pleasure to have him. Uh, Peter Blexley, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Well, Peter, now, you, you, uh, if some of the people that don't know you in, in L.A., but um, I've watched four, four seasons of one of the series you've done, Hunted, and, of course, you've got a great book out. You've got a few out, but um, one I know about. Um, but where did it all start for you? Let's, let's, let's fill in the people so we kind of know who you are and kind of where it all started. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm 61 now, and all those years ago when I was born in south-east London, in a largely suburban kind of area, I wasn't born into the mean streets by any stretch of the imagination. Um, my mother and father's marriage was miserable due to my dad's alcoholism, and uh, he left when I was about 10 or 11 years old, and at the time it was good riddance to bad rubbish, to be perfectly frank. But that left us in a house that we couldn't afford, so mum had to sell it. My eldest sister went off to nursing, and mum and I moved into a flat a few miles from where the house had been. Um, and then, essentially, I didn't have any male role models in my life. There was no close uncles or anybody else that I could look up to, take a lead from, and so I became a rudderless ship, basically. I very foolishly truanted got involved in some petty and pathetic crime, shoplifting, criminal damage, graffiti, that kind, of, that kind of stuff. And eventually, at the age of 16, got myself a job working as a warehouseman. Um, but that didn't really match my mother's hopes and expectations for her only son. So one night I came home to the flat, and sitting in the lounge was an enormous uniformed policeman one of what we used to call a beat bobby. Sadly, there's nowhere near as many of them now as there used to be. Somebody that knew the community, the area, somebody that was trusted, you could reach out to. And my mum had done exactly that. And she got him to sit me down and basically sell the idea to me, as a 16-year-old, of joining the police cadets, and then at 18, becoming a police constable. And this cop did a brilliant job of selling the, uh, the career to me, the opportunities, the variety, the excitement, everything that I could potentially experience. And before he left, he pulled out the application form, which I filled out, and a few short weeks later, having had a haircut that I thought was short enough, but I soon found out it was nowhere near short enough, I walked through the gates of the Metropolitan Police Cadet Corps College in, in Hendon, in North London, and suddenly... And quite dramatically, I discovered the benefits of discipline. I learned about respect, both for myself and other people, and it utterly transformed my life. Peter, the, the, the force that you went into those years ago is a very different one than we have now. And um, so going from that, those teenage years where you were on, on the verge of and getting into that kind of low-level criminality, how did you adapt to kind of quite a, a rugged profession then, especially as a cadet. Yeah, well, I, I left the cadets at 18 and a half because you move up to go to the other end of the training 
school estate and you become a, a police constable, you get sworn in, do your training. And, and remarkably, I came top of my class. So the transformation had been quite uh, considerable. And then short of my 19th birthday, I get posted to Peckham in South East London. Now, this was the mean streets. This was an area with some chronic social deprivation, um, a very high crime rate, and a large Afro-Caribbean population. What had happened in the UK was that in the late 50s and the 1960s, the, the black people came over from the Caribbean, the West Indies, and now, of course, in 1978, their kids were growing up, and they were largely disenfranchised, had a lack of opportunity, and were being brutalised and suppressed by a largely racist police force. So some of what went on there was absolutely horrific. I mean, just abominable. And in 1981, our neighbouring police borough of Brixton went up in flames. And I was there that weekend when rioting hit the streets of the UK, the like of which had never been seen before. And there were literally hundreds of people there that wanted to kill me because of the uniform that I wore, the symbol of oppression that it represented. And after that weekend, when I thankfully got home largely uninjured, I vowed to get out of uniform and never wear it again. So would you say it was quite a, a, a slow transition? Because obviously going from being a little bit of a, a ruffian, if you like, when you were younger, and then that continued in some ways because you were then within a system, an organisation that also had um, or, or included some an element of racism and brutality. So it was quite a transition. Was there a defining moment where you thought, you know, this is this is madness. This is not this is not right. This is not for me. Ruffians fitted in very well to the police force of the late nineteen seventies and the early nineteen eighties. I'm ashamed mm. to say. And I fell into that trap. There, there was no thing such as whistleblowing. There was no way that you could say, stop, hang on, this is wrong. We've got to do something about this. Because it simply would have ended your career. And quite possibly worse might have happened to you. But that weekend of 1981 in Brixton was an absolute game changer for me. A life changer. It changed the man that I was from being a pretty violent, vile and racist thug I realised the errors of my ways and I realised that oppressing people, repressing people, you know, people giving perjured evidence and planting evidence on people was simply not the way to conduct yourself. OK, did I kind of take the coward's way out by getting out of uniform and going in to the uh, criminal investigation department as a detective? Some could say I did and I would accept that criticism. But there was no way I was going to change the world on my own. And I thought, if I can't change the world, I'll change myself. And became a detective and left that kind of uh, appalling policing behind me. Which has, of course, now changed dramatically. I mean, the British police have moved on leaps and bounds from what they were back then. And an awful lot of people deserve an enormous amount of credit for creating that change and being a force for good. They're not perfect, but they are unrecognisably better than what they were back then. So at that time, did you have lots of choices as to what element of um, going into kind of, uh, being a detective meant? Or, you know, lots of different options as to what routes you were taking, or was, there, was it pretty generic? As a new detective, in essence, I had to go and police a precinct, so I was posted to a police station. And it was a very different police station from Peckham. I got posted to the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, where the awfully well-heeled and wealthy people used to live, work and play. So I got exposed to a completely different side of life, the like of which I'd never seen before. There was still crime, and a lot of it, but it was of a different type, generally speaking. There was fraud, and whereas the drugs in Peckham had overwhelmingly been cannabis now it was cocaine and uh, you know and, and, and so I got a far broader policing experience I was there for three and a half years which was the time scale you spent at any one police station and after that I managed to fulfill my ambition of becoming a Scotland Yard detective because Scotland Yard is a name that is renowned around the world 
in terms of law enforcement. And I was fortunate that at the age of 25, fit, fearless, um, I walked through the revolving doors at the yard and not long after that embarked on my undercover career. And so in, in terms of your, um, your, your family life, your, you, you've, got, you've got a family, you've got, you mentioned a sister earlier that went into nursing. Um, how, have they, how have they adapted to your kind of that, that change in your career? How, what were they thinking about that at the time? Because they'd obviously seen you change quite a lot. Yeah, I, I, I guess they had, but my sister moved many, many miles away and I didn't get to see her an awful lot. Um, my mum had remarried and, and whilst I tried to see her on a weekly basis, I, in essence, was so absorbed in my life and my career, just bulldozing my way through life, that, quite frankly, I, I, I was busy every day and, and potentially my priorities were not what they should have been. Okay, so you, you become a detective, you're in the precinct, very different in Kensington and Chelsea. Um, what happens next? What, where, what, what path does your, your police career or personal career influence that? Um, where do you go from there? Yeah, the, the, the next natural step was to be that Scotland Yard detective. You know, once you've got that on your CV, it will serve you very well because in the world of law enforcement, you can travel anywhere and say you're from Scotland Yard, and there is an inherent level of respect that will be afforded to you. Because you've got to be a decent detective to get up there, generally speaking. Not many slouchers or wasters make it onto a Scotland Yard squad. So it automatically tells anybody from law enforcement around the world that you're a hard worker, you're a dedicated detective, and you know your stuff. And so, um, from, from that point... Um You've got your couple of books out about um, your your desire to catch. You've always vowed you would catch Kevin Parler, one of the um, the criminals that um, on a case that you're working on, somebody who's wanted, should we say, for for two murders. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. Um, well, after, after I've done ten years working undercover at Scotland Yard, yeah, my, my life was and my career was dramatically. Um, turn upside down because I was parachuted into the witness protection program as a result of an operation that originated from a DEA informant in the States. Um, oh, wow. and, it had and it had global links. Um, it, it involved the police from Ireland, both Northern Ireland and south of the border, the British Customs, of course, us, the British police, the DEA, the FBI, and people from many other places. It was a huge operation. Uh, and essentially the bad guys ended up wanting to kill me, which was discovered in America. Um, and then a report got stolen that had my real name in it and never should have had my real name in it. That conspiracy tell, tell story. Us little, tell us a little bit about that. So how do you, so, so yeah, tell us from the beginning, so some more from the beginning. So the investigation led to the States and then how did that then for the report to get missing, go missing here? Tell well, it emanated from the States because it was a DEA informant that put the job yeah. up in the first case. The bad guys were only willing to smuggle the drugs into the UK and not the US. So that's right. kind of when the DEA lost a bit of interest in that. But we, the British police, still utilised their informant. Um, and it culminated in £4 million worth of heroin being delivered to me in a hotel at Gatwick Airport. Um, and after I'd weighed and tested the 30 packages, which took many hours, um, the bad guy and I left the hotel room, waiting in the lift, uh, the lobby for the lift to arrive, because we were going to go down to the bar and have a celebratory drink to mark the start of a very lucrative business arrangement, as he saw it. Of course, I knew what was coming. And the minute the lift opened, it was full of armed police. We were forced to the ground and handcuffed and... and that was kind of the end of that particular tale for that man at that point. So it was a very big, complex operation. There was a lot of infighting from various organisations around the world. And the Deputy Commissioner of the Met Police asked for a report to be compiled because he was going to a meeting with all these other agencies and wanted to be suitably briefed. Well, that report, that was fine with that report being compiled, but I should not 
have been referred to by my name in that report. What should have gone in that report was my number, which is allocated to me by the undercover unit. For some unbeknown reason, the idiot who wrote that report put my real name in it, then it was printed off, then it was taken out of a police building, in a briefcase, in the back of an unmarked police car, and then that same idiot went shopping, leaving the report in the briefcase in the car, shopping on his way home, and I bet everybody listening can guess what happened next. You've got it, the car got broken into. The briefcase and the report were stolen. So now, there is an established plot to murder me, because the bad guys thought if they'd kill me, they'd kill the evidence. Marry that up with a report that's now potentially in criminals' hands with my real name in it. Mm. And what that meant was that one night when I'm driving home, blissfully unaware of any of this that's going on, I get a phone call that says, don't go home. And I'm like, why? It's one of the bosses that's got the yard. Don't go home. Get your girlfriend and go home, pack an overnight bag, move into a hotel using one of your false identities and be at Scotland Yard, nine o'clock the following morning, we'll tell you what's going on. Well, I didn't get there at nine o'clock the following morning. Of course I didn't. I got there at eight o'clock and a mate of mine said, you know what's going on? I said, I haven't got a clue. He said, well, you need to have a copy of this. And he gave me the report. He said, and then he locked me in a tiny little room and said, read it. Well, I could not believe what I was reading. I could not believe that my life was at such risk and that it had been put at even further risk by this report with my name and it getting stolen and potentially landing in criminals' hands. It was ridiculous. And by the close of play that day, senior bosses at Scotland Yard had decided that I had to abandon my flat, abandon my life, give up my name and be parachuted hurriedly into the witness protection program. And so began the darkest, most miserable two years of my life, which culminated in a catastrophic mental health breakdown. So how does something like that so sudden, and I, I, I know, it, know it happens, I, I, I work in um, um, for local government and I work quite closely with police, and, and you, you know these things happen and have to happen, but I just think, how does that impact on your whole family? So at that time in your life, I mean, obviously the impact... It had an impact enough to, to, to give you a breakdown. So how does that, what happened to your family at that time? Did you, your girlfriend able to go with you? What about happened to your mum? You must have been worried that with your identity known, then obviously that opens up your family, doesn't it? And your close friends. Yeah, I mean, try explaining that to your family. Fortunately, my mum was remarried and didn't have my name anymore. So she was at pretty low risk. Um, my girlfriend was given the option as to whether she wanted to move in with me or not in this hideout. It wasn't a home, it was a hideout. Mm -hmm. And there were no kind of um, links between my girlfriend at the time and I. We didn't have a mortgage together. She didn't have her name on any of my bills in my flat or anything like that. So there was actually no linkage between her family name and my family name. So if she wanted to, she could move in there. She did. And unfortunately, she had to witness my breakdown. So she had a very miserable two years. And I shoulder part of the responsibility for that because whilst this situation should never have arisen, never, because of the report with my name in it and all, and all that aforementioned stuff, um, I didn't deal with it very well because I used to sit at night and conspiracy theorise about how did this happen, how did that happen, how could we have got to this, is there mm. some kind of conspiracy going on here? Coupled with the fact that I was terrified of the assassin's bullet, every day of the week, coupled with the fact that every time I came out to get in a car in the morning, I had to check underneath it to make sure nobody put a bomb under it. And here's the part in my own downfall. I drank too much and I smoked too much. And when you, when you kind of combine all these things together, plus the fact that the Metropolitan Police still wanted me to work undercover, so I'm living undercover in one identity, I'd occasionally be myself, and then I'm going off and working in yet another identity. It was an absolute recipe for disaster. Mm. And, and that's exactly what befell me, an absolute catastrophic breakdown. I became a monster, and uh, on, on one occasion, I very nearly killed somebody, and I then knew that I am such a danger to other people as well as myself. I, I need to be 
locked into a psychiatric ward in a hospital so that they can start to try and make me better. And how did you come out of that state of mind? Because that's a really dark and lonely place to be. So how did you come out of there? With the wonderful help of the British National Health Service, who cared for me, who nurtured me, who got me on the right medication, who taught me coping strategies, who, who gave me cognitive behavioural therapy, who gave me everything that I needed to try and piece my life back together again. I had three and a half weeks in hospital in that first stint. I wasn't fixed and brand new, of course, when I came out, but I was a, a long way down the, the route to recovery. Um, and I shall always remain indebted to them. Um, it was a, a, a dreadful time, but, you know, there, there, there were many, many more brighter days ahead, fortunately. And so after those, you, you mentioned that being a couple of years, the darkest couple of years of your life. How did how do you come from being um, almost a hidden person in a witness protection unit from getting back out there, you know, and 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 I suppose being more overtly yourself? How does that happen? Yeah, I went from a very very secretive life to where I am now, for example known to many, many people as that broke off the telly or the radio. Um, well, That's what we called you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that all came about because, you know, I've, I got medically retired from the police, so I'm 40 years old, still a young man, um, and I'm on the scrap heap of life. No education to fall back on, no apprenticeship, no training, no craft, and then I thought, what on earth am I going to do? Well, I was still very unhappy with the way that the police had treated me. So I thought I'd write a book. And I got threats, people ringing up, leaving wonky messages on my answer phone, threatening me not to write this book and all that kind of stuff. Cops that were terrified about what I might write about, I might suspect. Um, and, and I was lucky I got a publishing deal for the book, The Gangbuster, which was published in 2001, and still sells. It's on about its fourth or fifth reprint. And people still enjoy it, which is which is lovely. Um, and suddenly, from that very very secretive life, you know, at one extreme witness protection, utterly anonymous, to suddenly I'm being interviewed on the radio and telly, and asked to comment on policing and crime and how they impact upon society. And then a TV production company picks me up as a story consultant to a major television drama that was on the BBC at the time. And one way or another. I've stayed in the media for the last 20 years, and now I've written four books, three plays, uh, took part in a, a very popular Channel 4 TV show called Hunted, which Al referred to, did six series of that. And, yeah, I've, I've, I've been extremely fortunate, and I think my, my positive, optimistic kind of outlook has served me very well. And the fact that I'm a determined blighter, and um, if I set out to do something... I, I, I will simply not give up. And I think that takes us really quite nicely to the Kevin Parler kind of um, situation, doesn't it, where you've absolutely said you're not giving up on this one. So so this this was the death of two very young people, a 16-year-old and a 22-year-old. Um, so tell us about that, because that would have been in your policing career. No, it so wasn't. No, no, it they, wasn't. They, they, it was, no. It was no, no, this didn't happen when I was in the cops. Um, because right. I, I left the police in 1999. Crikey, I'm old. Um, <laughs> and and uh, at the end of February 2019, I left the, the TV show Hunted, announced that publicly, and I was deciding, right, what's going to be my next major project? My two previous books had been about unsolved murders. I, I call myself an old sort of shoe leather detective. You know, I go out there and I knock on doors and I shove flyers through hundreds of people's letterboxes, and I get in front of people and meet them and talk them and develop sources. And I'm very lucky in so much as that people see me, they, they see me in, in the media, and they talk to me and they trust me, which is wonderful, because without people's trust, I wouldn't be able to get anywhere. And I decided that the best thing to do, because I'd become quite well known in the UK for hunting pretend fugitives on a TV entertainment show, I thought instead of doing strictly unsolved murders, what I should do now perhaps is hunt a real fugitive. And my publisher agreed uh, for me, you know, to give me a book deal to do that. 
And so on the 29th of April 2019, at a press conference, I launched my hunt for Kevin Thomas Hall, who is now a 40-year-old, six-foot-six tall Liverpudlian, a scouser, if you will, who is wanted in connection with two ghastly murders. Uh, the first one, 16-year-old Liam Kelly. I mean, 16, he's a kid, who was blasted to death with a shotgun in June 2004 in Liverpool. And then the second murder that Parle is wanted for is the blasting to death with a shotgun of a 22-year-old young woman called Lucy Hargreaves, who was the mother of three young children. And everybody that I've met tells me that Lucy was as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. Paul has lived a life of Riley. He should be a household name in the UK, but he quite simply wasn't. So I've set about to change all of that, to raise his profile, to raise the public awareness of Paul. I've travelled widely before, obviously, COVID restrictions kicked in. I've been utterly dedicated to this for the last 21 months. And there are only two things that will stop me hunting Kevin Powell. One, of course, quite obviously, is his capture. And secondly, is my death. It's as simple as that. I will never give up because this is for Liam and Lucy. This is about truth over lies. This is about right over wrong. And this is about finding a man who is wanted in connection with both of these crimes. He's not convicted, but he's wanted for them, so that he can stand in a court and answer the allegations made against him. That is only right and proper. So what was it about this particular... I, I understand, obviously, it's tragic, it's, it's awful. Uh, you, what was it about this particular, these particular young people in this case that drew you, drew you to... Um, going after Kevin as opposed to any other case out there with um, that's unresolved with maybe people on the run? The, the crimes speak for themselves, you know, a kid and a mum of mm. three. Um, they're, 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 there is no greater motivation I need to get out of bed first thing in the morning and work morning, noon and night trying to find him. Um, and he's the only person in the UK currently wanted in connection with two separate murders. He's on the National right. Crime Agency's most wanted list and he has not had the publicity that he should have had and I've been turning that round in the last 21 months the BBC commissioned a podcast about my hunt for him which is called Man Hunt Finding Kevin Powell and it's on the BBC Sounds platform mm -hmm. and wherever wherever else you might um, find your, your, your podcasts and it's been downloaded over three million times. It won an award at the New York Radio Festival Awards, which was very pleasing. And consequently, his profile has been raised dramatically. I've also had a book published about my hunt, which is called Man Hunt. And that's available on Kindle or an audio book as well as paperback. That has sold in its thousands. And it's a very, very different thing from the podcast. Many people have enjoyed both. The podcast really gives you a history uh, of, of the crimes and of the city of Liverpool and what life on the, the run is like, all of that kind of background. Manhunt gives you my personal narrative, my journey through this hunt for Kevin Powell. And I have been through the emotional ringer through this. Organised crime has successfully wasted my time Wasted my efforts, my emotions and my money. Well, you've got to expect that. If you stick your head above the parapet as a single kind of individual armed only with a notebook, a pen and a mobile phone, then you're going to expect that organised crime will try and take, make a mug of you. And they did on one occasion, but all that does is strengthen my resolve and make me more determined. And am, I, am I right that I heard that you've um, you've had your house, um, y y the house actually photographed and, and put online or made public, yeah. Peter? Did I hear that right? Yeah, yeah. Those with Kevin Powell's best interests at heart have posted photographs of my house online. On one occasion, 
including an accurate description of the bedroom that I sleep in. Well, you crack on. You do your best, because you're not going to stop me. You're not going to frighten me. You're not going to make me pack it in. It's simply ludicrous. And all that does is serves to kind of infuse me even more, because they've got his interests at heart. And why have they got his interests at heart? Because he's an asset to organised crime. And I'm going to turn him from an asset into a liability. So that eventually, unless organised crime is willing to have its whole criminal empire come crashing down around its ankles, they might see sense and give him up. And of course, when you're, you're chasing pretend fugitives in Hunted, you're, you've got the, um, the replication of the powers of the state to assist you. How... How are you managing that? I mean, you've just said your notepad and your, your own intelligence, your own information gathering, and that's all you have now. It must be incredibly frustrating. It's difficult. It's very difficult. But so be it. I, I, I kind of knew it wasn't going to be a cakewalk. Um, I've got a relationship with Merseyside Police. That's the police force that covers the area where both the murders were committed and where mm. Paul was born and raised. Um, that's been a bit of a prickly kind of thing, to be perfectly honest with you. But there's a new senior officer that I'm dealing with. And this officer seems to have a more enlightened kind of attitude towards what I'm doing. Perhaps rather than the previous one who I think would have preferred me just to go away and mind my own business. <laughs> well, I'm not that kind of bloke. This officer seems uh, younger and a bit more energetic, shall I say, and the, uh, the, the early signs are encouraging. I'm optimistic because I've always believed it will be a cooperative approach that is most likely to deliver Kevin Powell into handcuffs. And as we speak today, I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic, but yeah, let's, let's see where it goes. I think this could be a real sea change because if the police are as determined to catch Kevin Powell as I am, then his time on the run is going to come to an end sooner rather than later. The more people move around, I mean, just thinking of location-wise, the, the um, more risky it is for them to be found. We, we know that. So, so how would... Um, so do you think he's gone far? Do you think he's pretty settled somewhere? Do you think he's, he's in the country? He, he has moved. Um, and I know that whilst he's been on the run, he's been in Spain, Thailand, Dubai and Ireland. Um, right. But movement, as you say, equals risk. And when, mm. he's, when he's confident that he's safe and he's secure somewhere, he, bolt, he, 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 he kind of beds down and he stays there. It's just a case of me trying to find that location. And I will. I will undoubtedly find it. So have we, have we identified his travel post-travel, uh, when he pops his head up somewhere else because he comes complacent or becomes a little bit too settled somewhere, or are, are we able to see his travel as it happens? No, I, I, I'm not able to monitor it as it happens. You know, the, the, the sources of information that speak to me are, are sometimes quite far removed and not able to get direct access, and you would understand that. This is a very yeah. smart, intelligent yeah. guy. You know, people have repeatedly told me, how intelligent Kevin Powell is, um, right back from his days at secondary school. So I know I'm up against a, a pretty smart adversary, and of course that is borne out by the fact that he's been on the run successfully for 16 years. You can't be an idiot to achieve that. And it do we know what his, do sorry. we know what the hypothesis is for his the motivation for the murders? Uh, What's yes. The Liam, Liam was killed over a £200 debt. Uh, it's as pathetic as that. Liam lent somebody £200, didn't get the money back, went to a, a relative uh, of, of the person that he'd lent the money to, and he threw a bicycle through a window. Liam did. Um, he then got called on to what criminal circles call a straightener, a meeting whereby they might get things straight between them. But I know from first-hand experience working undercover all those years, these straighteners very rarely end up very well. And sadly, this straightener led to Liam's death. Lucy, tragically, died because of her choice of partner. 
um, the uh, the attack on her house, a court was told, an unsuccessful trial, um, was in an effort to do harm to her partner, who was upstairs sleeping in bed with their youngest child, a two-year-old, because the other two kids were with their grandparents. So it just goes to show how amateurish and pathetic those people were, in so much as that they got it so dreadfully wrong and snuffled out Lucy's young life. Um, all the more reason why Kevin Powell needs to be caught and answer the allegations made against him. I think the um, previous uh, police officer, Captain, that you were dealing with um, wasn't so eager to work with you. Well, the British, you know, the, the police were presented with a, an unprecedented situation over here in so much as that there was this oiky bloke from South London poking his nose around, making a podcast, writing a book, essentially doing the police's work. And I, there I say it, but in many regards, our police over here are not as enlightened as some on the, in the States are. For example, I watched that Jeffrey Epstein um, documentary series that we had over here fairly recently. And in that, it showed how the police could work quite brilliantly with a private investigator. They worked cooperatively. The private investigator gathered the evidence of Epstein breaching his bail conditions, and the police welcomed his work and his efforts. It's not like that over here in the UK. The police like to think they've got a monopoly on all things law and order, but they haven't. There are companies out here now providing private security patrols to residential streets, something that would have been unheard of a decade or so ago. And there are many private companies now doing work that previously was done by the police. So they are losing their monopoly. Unfortunately, some of them have not quite realised that working with me is something that should be embraced and we should have a cooperative kind of mutually respectful common goal but as i say i'm optimistic this new officer that i'm dealing with might absolutely be the epitome of that which which would be wonderful yeah i i guess some people probably feel challenged right they probably feel um maybe threatened a little bit yeah absolutely yeah you know the, the police are are a bit kind of parochial about things. You know, they, 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 they work in fortresses, so they get a bit of a siege mentality, I think. And they're very peculiar and particular about their domain. Well, you know, the 21st century is over 20 years old now, and things are changing. And there will be things to do with crime and law and order that they will have taken from their grasp. But, again, there's been enlightened countries where they've worked with podcasters. Podcasts have solved crimes across the world. It just seems to be that UK police are very slow to get up to speed with this and, and, and also reluctant, unfortunately. But we, we, we shall see. Maybe this new senior detective that I'm working with is going to be an absolute groundbreaker, a pioneer, and he's going to drive a coach and horses through dated thinking. Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, the Hunt, Hunted series that you were in, um, I don't think that could have, um, it wouldn't have worked in the U.S. Well, they did, they did one series of the U.S., um, in the U.S., because my great friend and colleague, a guy called Ben Owen, who was my deputy, he came over and did the U.S. series, but it was limited, I think, to about three or four states. And it didn't get recommissioned. So you're obviously right, Al, in, in so much as that it didn't really work as a format stateside. Well, I just don't know, because they don't have the CCTV and they don't have the the license um, plate, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, they just don't have that set up right. that way. And I don't know if they would, because if there's so much of the privacy uh, stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame, really, because I'm pining for the United States of America. You know, back in the day, in the 80s, I travelled to Los Angeles a lot. I had friends who were out there, and I had some remarkable, hysterically funny times, misbehaving myself, of course, um, not in the 
dreadfully bad way, but, you know, it was the 80s in California. Yeah. And so, you know, Muscle Beach and the Sunset Saloon just off of Venice Pier, where I used to spend far too much time. Um, I've got treasured memories. I, I really have. And I would love to go back there one day and, and show my kids where Dad used to hang out with his friends in L.A. <laughs> it's changed a lot. Right. Okay. I'll brace myself. <laughs> well, the, the, you know, because uh, one of the things I've noticed through the Hunted series and through a lot of the things that I watch is that um, there doesn't seem to be as much of the, the um, I don't know, how do I say, the race problems um, that's going on with the policing in the U.S. No, we, 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 we've, by and large, learned our race problems courtesy of the Brixton riots in 1981. Now, it's not perfect, of course not. We've got 100,000 cops in the UK or thereabouts, and unfortunately there are stories where a certain squad office might be bugged and officers were heard using racist terminology or other inappropriate language and they've been kicked out. Good. It's unrecognisable from what it was. And whilst we do have vile elements of racism in the UK... Um, stubborn elements of racism in the UK, unfortunately. The whole perception of the police being manifestly racist that we're told happens in America via our media is not such a rampant and repugnant mm. problem in the UK. Hmm. Yeah, it's strange. What do, what do you think, um, the Hunted series, what do you think people get out of that? It's... Um, it's a character show. It's character driven, really. People pick their side, whether they, they, do they like the hunters or do they like the characters that are the fugitives? Um, yeah, it's character driven, essentially. A lot of people flip flop. You know, one week they like the fugitive and then one week they're warm to one of the hunters, either the ground hunters or somebody in the operational HQ. Um, and they, they struggle to make their minds up whose side they're on. But it's that whole cat and mouse, it really is, that, that I think attracts people so much. And when I was chief, um, we were utterly committed and determined to finding the fugitives. You know, there were personal and private and, um, and professional reputations on the line. So we didn't want to be taken for a bunch of mugs and made to look foolish. Likewise, the contestants, the fugitives are hoping to get a share of a £100,000 prize pot if they evade capture. So the stakes are high, the tension's high, the hours are long, there's always a camera in your face, um, and that brings a, a kind of pressure all of its own. Hence, occasionally, expletives would tumble out of my mouth and wait, make their way onto people's TV screens. Um, <laughs> but people loved it. It was, it was very popular. And, and the show has gone on, of course, without me. And I hope that it survives and thrives for, for many, many years to come. It's a great watch. I think what always surprised me about, well, I don't know if it does actually, it should, it should surprise me, but it doesn't, is people's stupidity. Yeah. Um, you know, with a camera in your face, knowing that that prize money is, is huge, and then making some really stupid mistakes that, you know, when, although it's, I suppose it's easy saying that when you're not, you're not on the run. But, um, you know, just those ob very obvious things that, that would track you down, like the use of your, 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 um, your bank card, for example, you know, very easily traceable things. And, and actually having too much faith in, in other human beings not to shop you in uh, when you're asking for lifts everywhere, that trust in people. Yeah, well, I'm often asked, you know, what advice would I give to someone if they were going to become a fugitive on hunting? And it's quite simple. I say, be nice to people. Just be nice to people. If you are genuine and nice, then they will give you a lift, cook you a meal, give you a bed for the night, wash your clothes, take you wherever you want to go, and they'll put a few pounds in your pocket. But if you are in any way unpleasant, or if you're a little bit full of yourself, they will pick the phone up and tell headquarters where you are. So yeah. well, that's the big tip. And I guess it applies to real fugitives, although I shouldn't really be giving advice to real fugitives, <laughs> should I? Right? You know, be nice to people. Well, you know, the, the, I, I wouldn't... 
I, I also don't understand the desire some people uh, get into it and they just have to contact their family or their friends. It, it, it makes no sense to me. I, I, I would just shut it off for the month. Yeah, but the lure of, of home is very strong, of loved ones. And it's been the downfall of many a real fugitive as well. If you look back through the criminal history books, you will see there will be many a fugitive that foolishly made that phone call home because they just couldn't let the anniversary or the birthday go by. It happens in real life. It happens on a TV reality show like Hunted. Wow. So, Would, would you be a fugitive? Yeah. Now, on, on, on Hunted, would you give it a go? They'd never catch me. They'd never catch me. Yeah, yeah. If I, was it, asked, if I was asked to do it, you know, for charity on, say, the... Celebrity hunted, although there's a big stumbling block there because I'm manifestly not a celebrity. But if they did ask me to do that, yeah, they'd never catch me and I'd give them the runaround like they've never had the runaround before. We look forward to it. Sounds like a threat. <laughs> um, okay, so now where do you see yourself now, like going in the next five, ten years? What, what's next for you? Utterly committed to finding Kevin Powell. Um, and, and nothing will change on that front. I have to do other work, of course, because I've got to put food on the table. You know, I've still got my two youngest boys are 18 and 19, one at uni, one going to uni. Very expensive days. So I have to keep working. In the last 21 months of hunting Kevin Powell, I have earned £13,000, every penny of which has gone on the hunt. Planes, trains, automobiles, gas, food, coffee, Diet Coke, hotel bills. We've been on the road for weeks and weeks and weeks. Obviously, we're not at the moment. So I have to do other work as and when it crops up um, just to keep my wife happy and be contributing to the household costs because hunting Kevin Barl is not something I do for the money. I do it for Liam and Lucy. Um... I will continue to write books, I hope. Um, the BBC have commissioned more episodes of Manhunt Finding Kevin Powell, so we will be bringing that back as soon as I can make some of the information that I'm sitting on public, because uh, I can't do that at the moment because it would benefit Powell and his cronies. Um, and, yeah, I, 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 where, where do I see myself? Still writing, still investigating. I'm a born investigator. It's at the bottom of my boots, and, and I'm probably never going to give that up. I've got an energy and enthusiasm for work that I had when I was half my age and half my weight. So I'm just going to keep going. So what's your contact information? Uh, do you have a website or a place that people can come and stalk you or, or you know, if they... Absolutely. <laughs> yes, thank you. My website is peterblexley.com. Please remember the unusual spelling of my surname. B L E K S L E Y. PeterBlexley.com. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, all as Peter Blexley. Quite frankly, I could not be more contactable. Yeah, and you can watch him uh, do some incredible dancing. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you see, I, I, um, I've put an invite out on Facebook and you didn't bother letting me come onto your Facebook page. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. When was that? I must have overlooked that. It's only yesterday. I'm teasing. Oh, I, did, okay. I did see some of the dad dances. No, I put the request in yesterday because I wanted to see to, um, to Al said about your dancing, so I thought I'd better <laughs> check this out. Yeah, I think we need to put the word dancing in inverted commas, okay? It's dad <laughs> dancing of the most excruciatingly <laughs> embarrassing kind. My kids are so mortified by it all. But all I try to do, you know, my work life is serious. We're living in strange and challenging times. And I just try and raise the mood a little bit by giving people a laugh. I mean, the laugh is on me. And I'm more than happy to, to, to take the mickey out myself. And no, it keeps people and entertained, doesn't it? It's good fun. That's it. We've got to spread a bit of happiness if we can, surely. What do you? Was it, how how is it going for you with the COVID and all that? It, does it sort of 
does it affect your your performance like with with writing and with just everything well we live in the age of the digital detective don't we thankfully or the desktop detective whatever you want to call them so i can sit here and still do an awful lot of work in my hunt for kevin Parr. but covid is catastrophic over here at the moment the death rates are astonishingly and tragically high the infection rates are albeit they are coming down um but i'm delighted to say that I'm getting my first COVID vaccination tomorrow morning. Um, so I'm very pleased about that. Um, I can't help but think that vaccines or a combination of vaccines are going to be the only thing that's really going to get us out of this appalling situation we find ourselves in. Well, I hear that uh, you'll when they do it, they put a chip in. Bill Gates will be watching everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I put a gag out on um, on Twitter the other day because I took my mum about three or four weeks ago to get her first jab, and I said that obviously she is now entirely controlled by Bill Gates, who has the best lemon drizzle cake recipe in the world. Yeah, I, but does that, does that does that sort of worry you? Um, being around because you know in the world like i'm 59 and i i i'm just i'm just kind of stressed out by all of these you know the drizzle and and all of these rumors out there the the, the jewish um what's that one the jewish laser beam that's causing the the global warming or whatever like uh, people people are buying this and really believing this doesn't that sort of get you a, a little scared no, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I was once upon a time, and we all know how that ended up. It ended up with me having a catastrophic mental health breakdown. So, no, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I trust the brilliant, clever people who, unlike me, actually paid attention at school, learned <laughs> stuff, went to universities, and made the best of their brilliant minds. And consequently, they've managed to discover and manufacture these remarkable vaccines, which in some way, shape or form, will lessen the, the, the catastrophic effects of this wretched virus, which keeps morphing into different variants. I firmly believe and place my trust in the brilliant brains, the conspiracy theorists that know diddly squat and can't tell their ankle from their rear end um, are not people that I will entertain in any way, shape, or form. Well, there you have it. Um, well, well said. Um, we are out of time now, and um, we've really enjoyed the conversation. Our guest has been um, Peter Blatsky. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you once again. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.